Hello, welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevard. Nadze, now with a new chill in US Russia relations undeniable, both sides are locking horns over Ukraine. With each blaming the other for the chaos in the country, it's kind of difficult to uncover the truth in the middle of all the rhetoric. To make sense of it all, I'm joined by award winning journalist and author Chris Hedges. The threat of war over Ukraine is getting more solid by the day. And while the sides are still hesitant to go all in, another battlefield is already seeing heavy action. The information front. Is the war of words the main battle of the 21st century? Can truth survive it? And who's paying the price for the information conflict? Chris Hatches, veteran foreign correspondent, Pulitzer Prize winner, author, it's really great to have you on our show today. Right, so Chris, you know, America often appeals to its First Amendment rights and freedom of speech, but then I can't help but notice that the U.S. officials are very weary of having any journalist voice an alternative point of view. I'm sure you heard um, Secretary Kerry's statement over RT. Um, why is that? Well, there is, uh, as with any government, an official narrative uh, that they seek to disseminate to the public and get the press to adopt. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was the Middle East Bureau Chief for the New York Times, and uh, the official narrative, which is a pro-Israeli narrative, uh, is one that often is in variance with the truth. Uh, and for those who attempt to challenge that narrative, uh, even if you work for the New York Times, uh, you feel the wrath, not only of uh, systems of power, uh, but often the media institutions themselves. Um, these media institutions have a vested interest in perpetuating this narrative, uh, and we saw that on the Iraq war, where the New York Times acted, in essence, as a mouthpiece for the Bush administration's uh, uh, propaganda uh, about weapons of mass destruction. Um, that's not a new phenomenon. It's not even particularly unique to the United States. Um, but the more intense a conflict becomes, the more you have uh, power vested in uh, perpetuating that narrative. And the Middle East, again, would be a good example vis-a-vis -vis Israel, uh, the more fierce and unrelenting their attack will be. And that is precisely what's happened here. But I want to talk a little bit more about Secretary Kerry's statement over RT, because that came after Foreign Minister Lavrov gave us interview. Actually, I was the one conducting the interview, interview focusing around Ukraine. And then the State Department hasn't really addressed um, Lavrov's concerns uh, over Ukraine. Instead, it preferred to steer the debate towards the channel Lavrov chose to give an interview to. Is this propaganda talk a way to evade a real debate? Well, the last thing they're interested in is an honest debate. Uh, you know, they have, uh, they will pick and select, uh, choose facts and sometimes uh, even uh, incidents that are not fact to perpetuate the narrative that they seek to disseminate. I mean, as a foreign correspondent, my job was often times to report uh, uh, on incidents and, and events uh, that puncture that narrative. Uh, and that was true with every administration I covered, starting with the Reagan administration uh, in the war in El Salvador and Nicaragua, where I worked, uh, you know, going on to the Middle East, especially the Israel-Palestine conflict, and even going on to Bosnia. Uh, and, then, and then I covered al-Qaeda. So um, I think the role of a free press is, is to challenge uh, the um, self-serving uh, propaganda that is put out by power in a vigorous and a free press. Unfortunately, the press in the United States has become very anemic, if not utterly subservient to power. Hmm. But why do you think the U.S. officials pay so much attention to RT? I mean, it is really obvious that the channel's American affiliate isn't reaching as many viewers as the mainstream players like Fox or CNN. Well, sure. But, I mean, uh, RT is presenting a narrative that Fox and CNN are not presenting. So they don't have to go after Fox and CNN. Fox and CNN are basically towing the line. No, RT isn't. And so... RT or any other media outlet that doesn't toe the line uh, is, is going to come under attack because mm -hmm. the, the purpose is to shut down uh, competing narratives.
Right. So um, since Ukraine is such a huge story and so much p attention is paid to which media um, says what, like in an argument, uh, U.S. State Department used fake photo evidences that later gets quietly debunked. For instance, the publication of alleged pictures of Russian soldiers in the New York Times. Now, the photos later turned out not to be genuine, although the newspaper did apologize, but it was hidden in a fine print and public opinion is obviously influenced more by an image. Is that a conscious tactic? I can't speak to that specific incident, but that is a common tactic. Um, and uh, images that buttress, again, the the narrative that those in power want disseminated uh, will find currency. And images, even if they're true, and again, as I speak as a foreign correspondent, that challenge that narrative uh, will not be disseminated. I mean, so many of the images, for instance, of the war in Iraq, which were widely uh, available to viewers on stations like Al Jazeera, never appeared on the American airwaves at all. Uh, and those images exposed a truth about the occupation in Iraq, the American occupation in Iraq. Uh, but it was too incendiary for the American media to pick up. So, um, I mean, we're, n we're not just talking about the Ukraine. We're talking about uh, all, uh, uh, you know, foreign policy issues that the United States uh, has invested themselves in, whether that's Afghanistan, whether that's Iraq, mm. whether that's... Israel, Palestine, or in this case, whether it's the Ukraine. Sure, but I'm talking about Ukraine just because it's such an acute topic right now, especially at sure. this part of the world, because we're like literally on the border. Um, so, just talking about these photos, uh, w the apologies were posted because they were fake, but then the officials from the White House are still using that argument and they would question us to their validity. I mean, is it sort of like well. anything goes here? Well, yeah. I mean, that, that's how that's how they play the game. Uh, you know, the uh, in the let's go to the lead up to the Iraq War. They, they would leak the White House would leak stuff to the New York Times, and then they would cite the New York Times as uh, an authority. Uh, you know, or go back to the first Gulf War in order to get support for the war. They created these utterly fictitious stories about Iraqi soldiers. Uh, dumping uh, infants out of incubators and hospitals and leaving them to die. I mean, this is this is business as usual. Uh, the U and the Ukraine uh, is certainly the narrative about the Ukraine uh, is certainly an, an example of it, but it's hardly an isolated example. Look, I don't know how it went down when you were a reporter in the Middle East and in the Balkans. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's not even an overestimation to say that we're definitely witnessing a media war, information war. It's probably the new type of war in 21st centuries. Could there be any winners in this? What do you think? There are no winners when, uh, when people don't know the truth. Um, uh, there's only disasters. Uh, and I think that the U.S. policy in the Middle East is an example of that. Uh, the extremely short-sighted to be kind to them, uh, decision on the part of this administration and past administrations to expand NATO, uh, you know, and, and to fail to understand um, that, uh, you know, Russia has legitimate security interests. Uh, we would hardly uh, react differently if Mexico or Canada was on our border and was uh, Russia was treating Mexico or Canada the way we are treating uh, the Ukraine and the Baltic states. And um, so uh, I think it's, it, it, you know, you can't make uh, astute foreign policy and you can't prevent disaster uh, if you operate on myth, because you're not actually having a dialogue. Uh, one side is seeking uh, to speak, uh, uh, you know, a truth or a concern, and the other side essentially fills their ears with wax and, uh, and, and creates their own narrative, which is not grounded uh, in reality. And that's precise, that's, again, it's not an uncommon phenomena, uh, but, it, but it's extremely dangerous because then you make judgments based on this mendacious narrative. So, um, uh, you know, if we create a, a kind of false narrative about the Ukraine and act upon it, you're, you're, you're creating, you're, you're fueling a crisis. 
in the way that we acted upon supposed weapons of mass destruction in Iraq when there weren't any. But also, I mean, having that 15-year experience as a foreign correspondent, more than anyone else, you know how distorted information gets on the way from the ground to your notebook, to the editor's table, to the newsstand in New York, or vice versa, to Moscow. Um, also, you know how hard it is for a foreigner, foreigner who comes to a strange country grasp the complexity of the situation. Is there such thing as one truth, really? In this sense, there is. Uh, the truth for, uh, let's say, uh, a Russian, uh, an ethnic Russian living in the Ukraine is a truth. Uh, the truth for an ethnic Ukrainian living in Crimea is a truth. I mean, there are, there are multiplicities of experiences. Um, but I do think fundamentally there are things that are true and things that are not true uh, in, in a kind of absolute sense uh, you know, no. But in terms of a journalistic sense, um, and you just cited, you know, this uh, picture, which turned out to be fraudulent, um, there, there are lies. There are things. And that's the role of the press. And the role of the press, I think the, the, the most vital role of the press is to give a voice to dissenting viewpoints, to people whose experiences do not conform to uh, the uh, particular narrative that is being peddled uh, by those in power so that their voices can be heard. And, um, you know, the closer you get to any situation, I speak as a foreign correspondent, the kind of messier and more opaque it becomes. But the job of a good journalist is to expose that opaqueness, to, to show all the multifaceted sides of it. Um, you know, what uh, an experience, you know, the, the varying experiences people have to reality. Uh, and I think that a failure to do that and, and the creation of a kind of of a stereotype or uh, the creation of, uh, of a narrative that is that where, where facts and images are confined to this kind of very narrow um, uh, vision that is peddled, then, then, then you know, we're talking about a lie. And, 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 you know, oftentimes, and I speak again as a reporter, the lie of omission is still a lie. And oftentimes in these conflicts, uh, it's what you don't say and what you don't tell that is as, as pernicious as as the lies that you, you echo uh, by those in power. All right, Chris, we're going to take a short break now. When we come back, uh, we'll continue to talk with Chris Hatches, Pulitzer Prize winner, journalist, and we'll talk more about whistleblowing and total surveillance and the implications of the information wars. Stay with us. back with Chris Hedges, author, Pulitzer Prize laureate, talking about media wars. Now, Chris, um, if we steer away from Ukraine uh, for a moment and just talk about Russia, why do you think Russia uh, keeps coming under informational attack from the West? Like, take, for example, the Olympics in Sochi. Now, if all I read was the Western press, I would definitely think it was a disaster. But, you know, I was there, and all of my peers were there. A lot of my foreign correspondent friends were there. And it looked quite the opposite once, you know, you actually saw what they had built in Sochi. Um, so I'm just wondering, is it just journalist laziness, like too much work to stray from cliches that actually sell? Or is it a conscious decision to follow them, to sell more, maybe? It's, career, it's careerism. I mean, you, you uh, unfortunately... Probably the majority of journalists are careerists, and they know what is good for their career, and uh, what kind of uh, stereotypes and what kind of narratives, uh, you know, are um, are going to get them ahead, both within the newsroom and uh, in terms of within the power structure itself. So, I would really put it down to careerism. I mean, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the uh, journalists at the beginning of the war in Iraq. Uh, you know, whatever doubts they had, uh, they put them aside because they realized that challenging that Bush narrative was a career killer. And I speak as somebody who denounced the war in Iraq while I was with the New York Times and lost my job because of it. Uh, so, well, you yeah, fired? I really think it's careerism. I think, you know, they're, they're very... Well, I was given a formal written reprimand for uh, denouncing the calls to invade Iraq, predicting exactly what happened. I spent seven years in the Middle East. I'm an Arabic speaker. Uh, and um, a formal written reprimand under the rules means that after you're given that reprimand, 
The next time I w spoke out about the war, I would have, they would have grounds to fire me, but I quit before because I wasn't going to stop speaking out. Hmm. Um, I want to talk about another phenomena, which is whistleblowing and Snowden. Um, mm, former UK Defence Secretary William Fox recently claimed that Snowden's leaks enabled Russia to act in Crimea and blamed him for a Crimean secession even and called the man a coward. Well, what do you think? I mean, aren't those claims a bit far-fetched for <laughs> someone who just leaked uh, government secret information? I mean, I, you know, I did a debate. I did a debate at Oxford Union over Snowden, uh, and we won the debate, uh, was whether the, the House would call Snowden a hero. And the way that they attacked Snowden was to, was to try and link him to Philby uh, and Burgess, British spies who uh, you know, uh, fled to then the Soviet Union. I mean, it was just insane. Um, uh, you know, what they're doing to Snowden is uh, a quite, uh, concerted and orchestrated effort at character assassination. Uh, it, because the fact is, he has exposed a clear violation of crimes against the Constitution. That's a statement made by the former Vice President Al Gore. And so rather than deal with what he has exposed, which is the wholesale surveillance uh, in, in, in direct violation of our constitutional rights, they go after him personally. So, I mean, that, that is the tactic, that has been the tactic, and that will be the tactic. <clears throat> but also, I'm but thinking. It's absurd, of course. Uh, but also, I'm thinking um, the revelations about surveillance are pouring in all the time. Uh, and knowing about surveillance doesn't really change the fact that we're still all being surveilled and it's all still happening. So, do you think it makes the right. whole Snowden well, affair lose its point? A, that's a ver well, that's what those of us in the States are worried about. Um, that there'll be some kind of cosmetic reforms, review panels, um, you know, they'll play around with who holds the metadata for how long, which is what the White House is doing, but the actual structure of mass surveillance they do not intend to touch. And unfortunately, although Snowden has exposed um, some very disturbing truths about uh, our security and surveillance state, um, uh, I don't, there's certainly no movement within the structures of power. There's no mass movement on the street. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that's my fear, that they, um, they'll keep doing what they're doing. But do you think the current chill between Russia and the U.S. has much to do with Snowden? Or that's already been forgotten? I don't think it has anything to do with Snowden. Um, I, I mean, they can't be happy that Snowden is there, of course. Um, but I, I think that chill is, uh, I, I don't think Snowden is any way uh, incremental or, you know, important to, to that, to the kind of, um, maybe antagonism is too strong, but, but the, the tension between the United States and Russia. Hmm. Um, you know that Pulitzer Prize uh, for the Washington Post and Guardian was uh, assigned for publishing those revelations. Now, that's a pretty big deal. That's a huge honor, right? But does that signal a wider acknowledgement of Snowden's revelations and wrongdoings of the NSA surveillance? You know, it's important in that it gives a kind of legitimacy to those revelations. I don't see how the Pulitzer could have, if, you know, the Pulitzer would have been a laughingstock if it didn't do that. Um, you know, this is a classic case of uh, leaking of documents for the common good, for the public good. Um, and I really don't think the Pulitzer Committee, I mean, I mean, I laud their decision, but I don't think they actually had any choice if they were going to have any credibility within uh, the journalistic establishment uh, as a whole. Um, uh, so it's important in that it's, it, it, I think, gives a kind of protection to those journalists like Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras and uh, Bart Gelman and others who wrote this, which, is, which I support. Um, um, but I, I don't know how much, you know, to go back to the point we made before, I don't know how much, I mean, I'm worried that it, that the system itself will, uh, continue without any, any kind of restraint, any kind of oversight, any kind of control. Uh, I mean, that, that unfortunately as the weeks go by seems to be where we're headed.
You know, there's an investigation going on in Germany over uh, NSA and GCHQ spying in that country. And even President Obama came out after those scandals broke out and actually said, yeah, this whole surveillance thing may be a little over the top. You know, we're going to try to sort of cut down that. But do you think London and Washington will agree to be part of that investigation in Germany? Well, no, they, you know, Merkel has asked the White House for... Uh, guarantees that German citizens will not be spied upon and, and the United States government won't give those guarantees. And they have no intention of giving those guarantees. Um, uh, I mean, the message, <laughs> the message, you know, if you really want to boil it down to what Snowden leaked, I mean, the message is, you know, uh, the United States will do anything it wants anywhere in the world and there's nothing you can do about it. That's sort of really the core of it. And, uh, um, and that's certainly been true in the case of Germany, hmm. which has had the most vigorous kind of popular uh, protests around uh, the uh, wholesale surveillance and and I wish we could have replicated some of that here in the United States. You know, some are really calling for Snowden to testify in that case. Is it an idea that Germany could pick up, you think, or it wouldn't risk angering the United States too much? You know, I, I can't answer that question because I, I don't cover Germany and I so I don't know the inner workings of the Merkel government. Uh, to be, to be able to give you an astute answer to that. Well, right now I want to talk to you a little bit about um, America's interests versus America's principles. Do you think Washington's stated foreign policy goals and its interests also always coincide? Because sometimes it does seem like the United States is hostage of its principles. Well, you know, th that kind of rhetoric is for domestic and international consumption. I spent my life on the outer reaches of empire whether that was in Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, the Balkans, uh, and I know the dirty work of empire. Um, you, you know, all the things about liberating Iraq and bringing democracy to the people of the Middle East, uh, that is to give a kind of moral veneer to uh, war crimes. I mean, preemptive war under post-Nuremberg laws is a war crime. So, uh, you know, I don't think any of us, and I spent 20 years overseas, take any of that rhetoric seriously at all. The last thing uh, the United States wants uh, in countries like Afghanistan or anywhere else is democracy. Uh, they want control. Uh, and um, I mean, we have a long history, whether it's Mossadegh in Iran or Arbenz in Guatemala, of overthrowing democratic systems when they do things we don't like. Hmm. Because, you know, we're seeing kind of the same thing now in Ukraine. There's a lot of very tough talk over the country, and there's been a gunboat diplomacy as well with NATO ships in the Baltic and the Black Sea, troop surges in the Eastern Europe, etc. cetera. Uh, but we're already seeing how cautious Americans get when there's talk of war. And I mean, American public, Paul showed no support for strike on Syria, like I mentioned, right? And President Obama didn't even go to Congress for approval. So that means nobody really wants to fight, right? That's my impression. Uh, and I don't think the administration wants to fight either. Um, I mean, would they send 600 troops to Poland or something? I mean, is this really? I, I uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm worried about it. And I'm worried about it for, you know, to go back to the beginning of the interview, because I think the American public is utterly misinformed about what has been happening in the Ukraine and the provocations that have been carried out by the United States and NATO on Russia's border, which we should not be doing, uh, you know, this is, and, and Russia reacts as we would react in a similar situation. Um, and I think it's just a very short-sighted and, and foolish foreign policy, the whole idea of trying to incorporate uh, the Baltic states, and there were even overtures made to Ukraine into NATO, is insane. Um, and uh, uh, so, but I, I you know, and, and that makes it dangerous, but I, I don't, I don't think there's any stomach here, not, certainly not on the street, but I think even at official levels for any kind of a, a real war. Chris, I certainly thank, pray that's the case. All right. Well, I hope you're right. Thank, thank you very you. much for this interesting insight and interview. Chris Hatches, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author. He was talking about the media wars in the 21st century. Um, thanks for being with us. That's it for this edition of Sophie & Co. We'll see you next time. Thank you.